are hoping for you to listen carefully and also be ready to ask questions after uh, Frederick is, is uh, done with this presentation, right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, I will try to talk slow. <laughs> but let's see here. Nothing happens. Uh -huh. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Fredrik Berthold uh, and I will give a presentation I have called The Story of Holocellulose, a collaborative work between RICE and KTH and the Wood Wadland by Wood Science Center. But before I start my presentation, I'd like to just say a few words about myself because I think many people are, don't know who I am. So uh, I, have, uh, I have been working here at RICE since 1997. I started here di directly after getting my PhD in wood chemistry here at KTH. Uh, at that time, I worked very much with um, wood chemistry in relation to pulping and lignin chemistry. But in the beginning of the 2000s, I was, got involved in a project started by Mika Lindström that also works here at RICE called fi the Fiber as a Building Block. And that is sort of the start for, for the later developments where I have been working with, uh, with the cellulose fiber. And uh, a lot of this work that I will discuss today somehow emanates from that uh, beginning. And in that fiber as a building, board, building block project, I worked a lot with uh, looking at the molecular weight of the cellulose and the pulp. So the outline of this presentation is I will give a background first and then I will discuss three collaborative works that we have done uh, and uh, then a very quick look at the future and then conclusions. And I know that this presentation is very information dense and I only have 20 minutes so perhaps I will not be able to, to, to present all of the material that I have put in here but, but I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry for that. So I wanted to give a background for this work and uh, the work uh, started actually, I would say already in a project called Biomime, which, what, which was a very big project that was before the Valen by Wood Science Center started. Uh, and in that uh, big Biomime project, there was a work package led by Professor Lars Berglund that was entitled Bio-inspired Bio Bio and Nanocomposites. And you can see here what the sort of the, the goals of that work package were. And uh, we were very interested in, in sort of getting pristine fibers uh, and fiber structures. And we were interested in this, the, the carbohydrates in the fibers. So Biomine was the beginning and one of the tasks that we had there was to, we were trying to develop a method to follow uh, ease of beating, if you will, how to beat the fiber and uh, get it to become a paper-like fiber. And the idea was to, to look at genetically modified wood and see whether you could follow this, this property and see whether genetic modifications led to some kind of, inf inf had some influence on the beating possible or beating capacity of the fiber. So we were, we were using fibers uh, and we treated them with ultrasound like this. And uh, we did this interesting observation. This uh, graph here shows uh, some kind of water retention value. In this case, it's called mini water retention value. It's not following the standard procedure, but anyway, it measures somehow the water holding capacity of the, of the fibers. And here on the x-axis, we have the treatment times in with this ultrasound or effective ultrasound treatment. And here we have a normal commercial fiber. This, in this case, a sulfite fiber. And this is our fiber here. And we saw this immensely rapid response in increased water uptake capacity. And we thought this was, wow, this was really interesting. And one should remember that at this time, uh, in the end of the, 2000s, I say 2008 and so forth. Uh, nanocellulose was very much on the on the walls everywhere. Uh, so this was had sort of what was what did we create here really? And this is just to show what these fibers looked like. Uh, we can see we had these exceptionally straight and interesting fibers. Uh, this was aspen wood in this case, uh, and here as, is after some ultrasound treatments. 
before going into uh, exactly this fiber, uh, what it is, I wanted to highlight this uh, about the lignification and how you remove lignin from wood. And uh, you can talk about something called selectivity, and that could be defined as the loss of lignin uh, above the loss of carbohydrates. And typically, commercial processes, this is a very schematic picture, I know that, but it's just to highlight the difference between sort of commercial fiber or commercial processes and uh, methods where you have a high selectivity towards the lignification. And this is one, one of the methods to, to make this kind of fiber was what we were doing. Uh, so uh, you have an, uh, you can have a uh, very high selectivity towards lignin and basically no degradation of the carbohydrates. Uh, and there is a definition for this that was a definition set up by Ritter already in 1933. The isolation of preparations containing substantially the entire polysaccharide portion of the wood should be called holocellulose to indicate that it includes both cellulose and hemicellulose. So this is actually the definition of holocellulose. And this is a material that you produce when you take away the lignin without removing the carbohydrates or minimizing the removal of carbohydrates. There are several different methods, but we see Ritter here in 1933 devised a method based on chlorine gas, basically. And a few years later, the acid chloride method was uh, devised by Jame. And this is still a very popular method to pre prepare holocellulose. And Polyak, Polyak introduced the parasitic acid method in uh, 1948. And this showed a very high selectivity towards lignin. And then there are, of course, a number of other methods that are more exotic, I would say. But these two are today maybe the, the, the dominating methods for producing uh, holocellulose and perhaps the acid chloride method is the most common one, probably because of the ease of, of doing it. But there is a, a slight difference between these two methods. Uh, PAA or parasitic acid delignification shows a very high selectivity towards, uh, towards lignin. So if you, if you think of this as a chip or a cell wall or some part of wood that you treat with, with, uh, with parasitic acid, you will have almost like a shrinking core model. That's how we like to look at it. So you will have a delignification going from that side in towards the middle here. And it leaves uh, a lignin-free material, the, the whole of cellulose. And uh, as you delignify, this uh, part becomes larger and larger. But it's a very heterogeneous reaction. In the acid chloride method, once you remove the lignin, the, the active chemicals have a slight reactivity towards the carbohydrates. So you will actually have a little bit of degradation of the, of the carbohydrates here. And this becomes even more pronounced as you move towards full delignification. So that's the reason why we picked or choose to work with parasitic acid because we were really, really interested in this highly pure holocellulose. So once we had uh, seen that uh, this material had these very nice properties or what, that we could make this um, cellulose nanofibrils from the parasitic acid holocellulose, we did some general um, the determinations of its properties. And here we have, I have listed some of the main properties of this material. They have a very high molecular weight uh, of the cellulose, uh, typically about 1.5 million Daltons. You have all, almost retained all the hemicelluloses. You will always have some loss, but you can have very high hemicellulose content. You will have a rather high charge, at least compared to commercial pulp. They are extremely easy to fibrillate. And uh, they have very fine di dimensions. Here we have the, the width of these uh, fibrils measured with as the forest microscopy, here we have a picture on, from which these measurements were made. You can see that these are even finer than uh, normal sort of standard uh, uh, SCNF. And we'd like to introduce, or we introduced uh, the concept of the core shell uh, fiber or an NSC, CNF. 
where we we like to picture this as you have a cellulose core surrounded by a, a hem hemicellulose sheath like this. So once we had observed that it was possible to make CNF from this material, uh, we wanted to look about on the mechanical properties of this material. And uh, the first work I wanted to talk to you about was published in 2015 and uh, was done by Sylvain Galland, who was a PhD student at uh, uh, Lars Berglund, and uh, also Kasimir Prakhovna, who was also a PhD student, were very industrial in this, in this project. But the main goals were here to prepare whole CNF uh, from PA dignified hard and softwood, then having this high molecular weight and uh, small fibril di fibrillar diameter. And from these uh, CNF preparations, prepare hollow CNF nanopaper to, to determine the, prop the mechanical properties using sort of a standard nanopaper production methods. And then also look at the, or compare these properties to more normal and semantically produced CNF. So the preparation first, or the procedure were as follows then, we prepared whole cellulose, and then uh, we made CNF by using a microfluidizer, following a procedure where you start with a, a more coarse uh, reactor. And uh, in our case, we only run our materials once through the coarse one, and then various numbers through the fine uh, uh, reactor in this microfluidizer. And then we made papers according to this procedure um, or films that we then measured mechan mechanical properties. We also did uh, size exclusion chromatography of all the fibers that we, we, were, we made. And this, is, uh, this slide is in from the paper and it just confirms the difference between parasitic acid and uh, chloride uh, delignification. We can see uh, this called zero, 00 here. I know there is a lot of information here, but basically this is just after various uh, number of passes through the homogenizer. But you have the material itself and you can see that comparing the, the traces from parasitic acid that lignified hard and soft wood and compare it to the same trace when you did the uh, chloride delignification, you can, you can actually see that you have had some kind of uh, degradation of the of the cellulose and hemicellulose in the chloride uh, cases. So from these films, we cut out samples then to test mechanically, and typically this is a typical result from those mechanical tests. And we can see that this is how they sort of uh, arrange themselves. Uh, the parasitic acid uh, films consistently or almost consistently came out having the highest strength and uh, stiffness wise they are more similar but strength wise parasitic acid was uh, generally stronger than for example chlorate uh, delignified holocellulose and uh, much stronger than the, the spruce then somatically produced NFC. And since we had the uh, size exclusion data we could sort of plot the size exclusion or the, the molecular weight against uh, measured strength. And uh, in this slide, we have the strength of the films on the y axis, and we have the observed molecular weight on the x axis. And these ones, uh, the ones numbered one, they have only been passed once through the coarse reactor in the homogenizer. And uh, we can see that they still haven't sort of fibrillated enough to form really good films. But what we could see here was a general trend that we have some kind of uh, correlation or yeah, between the strength of this, these um, sheets or films and the molecular weight of the material. Now there is something in the way for my data here, but what we could see is actually that uh, uh, this is just the strength of one of the samples, which is the one that has passed once through the coarse reactor and three times through the fine. And uh, behind this one, we have a really impressive strength <laughs> measurement that maybe we will see in a while here. 
Yes, so we observed these uh, properties of strength of 300, up to 320 megapascals and the modulus of about 16. And uh, at that time, and uh, probably still, this is maybe the highest strength that one has observed for this kind of uh, films made from nanocellulose. So we, we were sort of really thrilled by this material and uh, in the next, press, uh, next uh, part of this presentation I wanted to just briefly discuss work made by Kastanir Prokovna. Uh, she was very interested in um, structured nanocellulose materials and she worked with various kinds of foams and air, 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 air what do you call them, air, anyway, foam-like foam materials. And uh, in this particular, oops, sorry, I wanted to do like this. In this particular paper, we wanted to prepare holocellulose, uh, nanocellulose based honeycombs uh, and uh, relate their properties to uh, the structure property relationships. And we wanted to compare the properties of these foams with enzymatically, or, or foams prepared using enzymatically prepared CNF. And these uh, foams or honeycombs were made using a freeze uh, drying technique. I will show you briefly what that was. In order to produce holocellulose uh, suspensions with different concentrations, we centrifuged uh, ho the holocellulose, nanocellulose fractions to various concentrations. And it can be said that uh, the holo and the CNF was really, it's a very fine material, very difficult to concentrate this way. So we could not reach the same high concentrations as we were sort of perhaps like, but uh, as you will see later, we still got some very nice foams. Then uh, you use the, con the concentrated suspension and freeze it with li liquid nitrogen and freeze dry that, and then you get your, your foam-like material. And in order to get these uh, honeycomb structures, we, we use uh, one of the properties of water, when water freezes with the, with the direction sort of, it will form columnar structures uh, that will look like uh, honeycombs when you look at them. So what we did, we had our CNF suspension and we put it down in a liquid nitrogen and we had a uh, ice forming from the bottom here up towards the top of this, this uh, suspension then. And uh, in a, in a ESM picture, you can see how this uh, structure looked like. And this is maybe one of the more interesting results from this paper. It con uh, contis consistently showed that actually a very big difference between f foams made using CNF, enzymatically prepared CNF, and uh, the hollow based uh, CNF was that that you have a much much more, let's say, closed structure when you use the holocellulose based CNF compared to the enzymatic, where you see a lot of holes, it's a much more open structure. This is briefly about the mechanical properties of these honeycomb foams, and we can see the, here to the, we have two, two, uh, uh, results from compress, compressing tests of two different kinds of foams, one having a density around 10 and one with a density around 20, 25. And we can see that uh, the trace here for, uh, for the holocellulose is consistently lying above the trace for the, non, the foams made using cellulose nanofibers then enzymatically prepared. And here, down here, one has collected and summarized the data from, from various tests at different densities. And when it comes to the stiffness of these foams, we can see that the, uh, the holocellulose-based ones are clearly stiffer than the enzymatically prepared ones. When it comes to uh, total abs energy absorption capacity, they are more similar, but we can still see maybe a small trend that they are lying slightly above the, the normal enzymatically CNF. So concluding this work, we could see that we, it was possible to make uh, uh, holo CNF foams with different densities. 
it was very difficult to remove water from these uh, CNF suspensions, so um, it was limiting the maximum density we could reach. We could see that we had a very solid columnar 3D structure, as I showed in the microscopic pictures uh, from the hollow CNF materials. And we could see that especially the Young's modulus was dramatically improved using this kind of material or this kind of nanocellulose. To end up this presentation, I wanted to present a work that is, was done by Xian Yang together with me and Lars Beilund. He is a, a student that is still active in Lars Beilund's group. And um, he is very interested in how can you, can you use the, the fiber structure itself in order to produce material of, of interest and high performance. So in this case, we wanted to do to make um, what we call all cellulose composites uh, using is CNF, uh, hollow CNF fibers in this case. So we wanted to investigate the use of PA fibers in high density all cellulose composites. And in, in addition to that, uh, we also wanted to prepare uh, a composite material where we impregnated all cellulose composites with, in this case, Meth uh, methyl methacrylate so to polymerize into poly polymethyl methyl acrylate. And um, the procedure to make these materials is as follows. You have your wood, you delignify it, you have your fibers, you beat them in order to uh, make evolve certain properties. And in our case, then we used the uh, dynamic sheet forming uh, equipment in order to produce sheets of these fibers. And they have then a direction, they have a machine direction and a cross machine direction. And then you start by cold pressing these at uh, one megapascal at room temperature for five minutes, followed by hot pressing at, in this case, 105 degrees and 50 megapascals. And you end up with a film or a comp uh, all, in our case, what we call all cellulose composites that then was further impregnated and made into a composite material. This is now it's going to be a number of tables here, but anyway, these are the materials that we were looking at. MF still stands for molded fibers, and these four uppermost ones are and, uh, made from uh, hollow fibers. And this number here refers to number uh, amount of beating in a PFI mill. And these are references. These are just fully bleached cross pulp, beaten for 1,000 revolutions and 3,000 revolutions. And you can see here that we have very similar properties of these sheets, especially we can see that the density is quite similar and very high, actually. So what were the mechanical properties of these, uh, these sheets or these composites? And this sli slide has, uh, contains a lot of information, but we should focus on, on these data here, the Jung's modulus and the ultimate strength, maybe. And uh, we can see that we measured for unbeaten molded holus fibers an ultimate strength of 260 megapascal and the Young's modulus of 27 gigapascal. These numbers are very impressive indeed. And they should perhaps be a little bit compared to what you can achieve using normal cross fibers. These were beaten for 3000 revolutions and uh, you have about half the strength and half the, the, the modulus. You can also see that the beating of these all the fibers decreased slightly the mechanical properties, but even this material, which was more gel-like than fiber-like, I would say, still have a very high mechanical performance. And then uh, we, as I told you, we were making composites from these using uh, methyl methacrylate. And again, we got some really, really interesting um, properties of these composites. We can see here uh, the ones for the molded fibers, uh, hollow fibers. We have a 
strength of these materials in the, in the fiber direction of 310 megapascal and a Young's modulus of 20. This can perhaps be compared to one data from the literature where they have made a similar material using bacterial cellulose, which is also a kind of nanocellulose made from bacteria, highly crystalline and very straight and very, very high performing cellulose fibrils. And we, they have a slightly higher strength than maybe the similar type of, of um, modulus. And also what we could see is, and you can see it also here at, at the transmittance, we have a very high transmittance of these composites. So by that I have finished uh, going through some of the highlights of the work that we have done, uh, working on holocellulose. And uh, just briefly wanted to point out the way forward here. And one, 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 rather there are one key thing is what, 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 this, what kind of lignin is actually removed from the wood during this processing and what can it be used for. And another thing is to be able to produce higher, larger amounts of of uh, this kind of cellulose or holocellulose through some kind of upscaling uh, work in order to be able to look at more in um, a focused way for new uses and new concepts where you can use these kind of fibers and uh, materials. So in conclusion, I want to say that uh, the holocellulose that you can extract using a weakly acidic parasitic acid shows some remarkable properties. They are extremely easy to fibrillate. They can actually even be fibrillated using a blender sometimes. They show very, very high mechanical properties. They can be used to make all kinds of structured materials. They can also be used as fibers and then they can show some extremely high mechanical performance. And they can of course be used in composites as I showed you to also produce materials with high mechanical performance. There is also a, another conclusion I wanted to point out coming from this work. As you saw, this has actually been a collaboration that has been going on for more than 10 years, on and off I would say, but basically continuously for all this time. And this is almost like a little bit of a unique way to work together, to have an overall idea or problem that you work around and uh, that you can uh, put your effort to for such a long time. So uh, we think that this has enabled us to develop very uh, several new wood-based material concepts, but also perhaps even more importantly, it has been enabled us to, to build up a unique deep competence around these materials and actually cellulose fibers in general. That of course is for the benefit of us in Sweden and also for the Swedish pulp and paper industry. So I want to finish this off by saying thank you for listening to this presentation and also give thanks to all the collaborators that have been involved in this work over the years. Uh, we have several persons from KTH and three PhD students and we have also a number of persons from RISE here uh, that has been very active in this project. And uh, not, not least Eva Lisa Lindfors that ended, stopped working here at RISE 2012, but before that she was very active in this project and was very important person for bringing this work forward. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, Fredrik. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Now, I have a question for you. Uh, yes. Uh, can we uh, hold the questions from, from the audience until Lars has given his presentation? Absolutely. Okay. No problem. Let's do that. Uh, Lars, are you ready? Can I see that? Oh, you're still. I'm sorry, I did not present the, 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 <laughs> the key person at this seminar. She's keeping track of everything, right? Yes. 
<laughs> when I'm not, yes. So Helena Hallonen, folks, she's <laughs> doing a very good job here. <laughs> Okay. 